thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like eagles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness. If there's any that are not saved, we, we pray for their souls. We pray for our community. Father, bless us as we try to help our community and win men to Christ and win women to Christ, that they not perish. Father, give us a love for souls. He that wins souls is wise. And give us a love for you and an appreciation for you as we fail you so often. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. David's psalm is, Bless the Lord, O my soul. God is good and God is righteous. Because God is righteous and because God is holy, unholy and unrighteous men have a propensity and tendency to hate God. God isn't the way they imagine him to be or think him to be. It's like children. Okay, you get a little child in your house and you're training that child and you're teaching them the right way and their lust of their flesh, they want to go the wrong way. Uh, down the street, there's a family, uh, a, a corrupted family. They, they give their children pot and tobacco and sinful things and then they um, travel all around the world and everything and they come back and your kids look and say, well, we want to have that fun and excitement too. And you say, that's not God's way. And there, that there's a destruction coming to that, and there will be, because sin always has grievous consequences. And so God is holy and said, this is the way, walk in it. And God wants us to walk in his ways. His ways may not be as exciting, but they are certainly more peaceful, and they are more joyful. The world rarely ever learns and knows joy. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. God's benefits are multiple. What the thing is amazing to me is how that people watch man's deceived mind and heart, forsake God and righteousness, seeking a fulfillment and satisfaction to their soul, for a few things of sin, when there's so many things that you can do that are not sinful. Uh, people want to go to a, a bar and get loaded. Sinful. It's going to bring misery. All right? What could you do? You could go horseback riding. You could go fishing. You could go play tennis. You could go play golf. You could do many things in life that will give your soul a rest that's not sinful and God has no nothing against it you just are not to do those things and take away your time for God on Sunday and Wednesday Bible study and there's plenty of time I, I do all kinds of things um, less now that I'm older but I do I hunt I fish I love my wife there's just so much to do that's right to do and you don't need the sin because the sin's going to hurt you. But sinners, consumed by their lusts, cannot comprehend this. See, and who, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like eagles. Forgiveness, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy disease. If there's one thing common in all mankind, your neighbor, your friends, your husband, your wife, we all need God's forgiveness. Forgiveness, man's greatest need. It starts with God forgiving us all of our sins. Then we must learn to forgive each other in godliness and righteousness. Now, most of you here today, probably everybody here today is saved, born again Christian. You've Repent of your sins, you trust Christ, your Lord and Savior. That's where we're going to be today. We're going to start with the basis of forgiveness in God forgiving us. Tonight and probably maybe even next Sunday, we're going to deal with our forgiving of our friends and relatives and others because there needs to be a godliness and righteousness in our forgiveness. God said this to the people of Israel, and consider this when we get into forgiven. And we are obligated to forgive everybody of everything 
at every time and occasion. But he that departeth from iniquity maketh himself a prey. We have to forgive, which is the canceling of the debt, the forgetting of the action. But that doesn't mean that we should endanger ourselves or place our trust in people again. You see, forgiveness is one thing. Trust is another thing. Wherefore will you plead with me, God says? Ye have all transgressed against me, saith the Lord. In vain have I smitten your children. They receive no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. The people in Jeremiah's time were devouring their own prophets. I heard a message this week, and I'll tell you this. Most of it was a good message, but it was one of the most dangerous messages I ever heard. A young man got up and preached, and what he came to in, in the message, in most 95% of that message, 98% of that message was right on biblically. What he came up to was absolute rebellion in the way of righteousness. And you can't have it both ways. Either you're going to be righteous or you're going to be in rebellion. Today, America has no biblical respect for authority. And basically what this young man taught was the young man's responsibility was to get up and tell the old men off and put them in their place if they weren't correct biblically. So what he was saying is, and most of all you are parents, your children who have no experience, no responsibility, have not made or paid their own way, if they see you do something wrong, they're supposed to rebuke you as an authority and put you in your place. And I'm telling you, that is the height of apostasy and wickedness. And they're, they carry that to the church. Now, you have every right or liberty to not submit yourself to an unrighteous authority. You do not have a right to attack and overthrow that authority. In other words, we'll deal with the ministry. If you think your pastor is unfit to be your pastor, then you go to him privately and you tell him all the details and why you believe that. And then you say to him, Pastor, I love you and I forgive you, but I'm going to leave because I can't follow you. And you go out quietly and alone. You don't tell anybody else. You don't cause an insurrection. First of all, if you do it the way that young man said, you're going to cause more harm than good. And you keep the authority from repenting and changing. Let's just say, and now I'll be very vulgar so that it can't be missed. Let's say I had a, I've used it before. Let's say I have a habit of picking my nose. Isn't that awful when somebody picks their nose? You look, ugh, that's like, don't do that. Let's say I had that habit and I was preaching and I was picking my nose. And you just couldn't stand that. You couldn't handle it. Say, man, I can't go there and learn holiness and righteousness from a man that picks his nose. So you go, you say, Pastor, can I talk to you? You go to your pastor, you say, Pastor, I love you, but I cannot, I just cannot stay here under your teaching if you pick your nose every service. Now, you have no right to tell anybody else, because maybe everybody else can handle it. Maybe everybody else can say, Pastor, it's awful when you pick your nose, but I love you and I forgive you. And other than that, you're a great man of God and I love you. And I'm going to follow you and I'm going to forgive you that fault. You don't have any right or justification to sow discord in the church. To harm a body of Christ. You have every liberty to leave quietly and alone. One of the things that God hates is somebody that sows discord amongst the brethren. It's in the book. 
you don't have to be afraid to go and tell somebody the truth or even your truth. But if it may be your truth, it doesn't mean it's the truth. Because your truth may be, I just can't follow a man that picks his nose. But that doesn't mean anybody else can't. I don't know a man of God that's sinless and perfect and doesn't have fault or shortcomings. We are all trophies of grace. And forgiveness, if desired, must be given. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a witness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Now God's question is, have, 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 I, have I been telling you the right thing? Am I giving you darkness? Wherefore, say my people, we are lords. There's the problem. Self-righteousness, puffed up vanity, thinking that you've got it all together. And everybody else is below you. We will come no more unto thee. Now, it might be tough, it might be rough, and I don't think you're going to get it here. But I think, uh, me, if a man was preaching the truth of God's word and teaching the truth of God's word and living a basically holy life, and he picked his nose, I'd still come to his church and I'd follow him and I'd listen to him and I'd forgive him and I'd give him grace. I hope I don't pick my nose. <laughs> Nobody ever told me I do when I'm preaching. Maybe I do. I don't intend to, don't want to, and if I do, tell me, say, you know, you really do. <laughs> and then I'll go, ugh, and I'll pray to the Lord, say, Lord, help me break that awful habit that looks bad, and you could pray for me. But I'll tell you this, one wife, 34 years, faithful in vows, in sickness and health, for better, for worse, until death us do part. Still taking care of her, still loving her, still being her faithful husband. One church, faithful. One calling, one hope, one faith. I have flaws, sins, and shortcomings. But God also gave me a heart to follow him. And God gave me a heart to be faithful. And God gave me a heart to be faithful in that I must forgive every brother and sister their faults and their sins because he forgave all mine can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire yet my people have forgotten me days without number and see now here's your problem uh, and when you get messages like that uh, these folks are uh, listening to other people's messages they're not reading their Bible it's amazing the Bible that I never hear preached when I go around. Uh, it's like um, about one-third of the Bible is preached when I go around. Two-thirds of the Bible is never brought up. I'll tell you what I've never heard. You've heard me preach it. What I have never heard at a single fundamental uh, group is anybody preach the golden rule. Now, you're saved and I'm saved. We know the golden rule has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. You cannot get to heaven. But that Bible says that we're to, in the New Testament, in the Pauline epistles, that we're to walk in the Spirit. And we're to follow the righteousness of the Spirit. And we're to be under the law of Christ. Those are both in the Pauline epistles. And whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do you so likewise on them, for this is the law and the prophets. That is the essence of righteousness. That is why you and I needed a Savior, because we never lived that righteousness in the law. And when we are born again, then God is expecting us to crucify our flesh and walk in the Spirit and follow Him. Now, I want to tell you something that I've never heard a fundamental preacher or teacher ever teach. I will tell you this. Since the day George Birkinshaw, your pastor, got saved, his flesh has changed very little. 
The only blessing that he has in his flesh these days is that as he gets older, his flesh doesn't have the lusts and desires in the strength that it had when he was younger. But what happened that made George Birkinshaw your pastor different and should be making you different is at the age of 24, he repented of his sins and he asked God for forgiveness and God circumcised him with a circumcision made without hands and God came, sealed his soul and made his soul sinless and came in and started dwelling in his soul. And what makes George Birkinshaw, your pastor, which should make any and every Christian different, is when they listen to that spirit of righteousness as revealed in the word of God and obey that rather than the lusts of their flesh. My flesh never stopped lusting. My flesh never stopped being anything but corrupt. Paul said, Paul, probably the greatest Christian, saved, born again, member of the body of Christ, the world has ever seen, far superior to any Christian I've ever seen, said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I've never had a good thing dwell in my flesh. My flesh is going to the grave. Your flesh is your saved is going to the grave. It's going to rot and be gone. You're given a new body because this flesh is no good. You're given a new body for your soul that's been sanctified and your spirit that's been made right. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. I'm seeing a lot of Christians twisting the truths of scriptures. Since George Birkinshaw got saved, his soul has never sinned. Since you got saved, your soul has never sinned. But if you're honest, your flesh has not been, oftentimes, what God would have it to be. I have not sinned. The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we are a liar. I fight against sin every day. My body says, do this. And the Lord says, you don't want to do that. That's not right. I said, I know, Lord, but my, my body wants to do that. The Lord said, yeah, but you're going you're gonna to follow me or you're going to follow your flesh? Well, I'm going to follow you, Lord. And crucify your flesh. Tell your flesh, no! That's what I have to do as a saved born. And that's what you should have to do. That's what God expects you to do. He expects you to know him, walk in his spirit, and say no to your flesh and its lust. You can give your flesh its righteous desire. Say, Oh, man, a rough week, and I just want to get away for a little bit. And uh, Like me, I, love, I use because I love to ride roller coasters. And after a lot of trials and my flesh is worried out, worried, wore out, I like go to a music park and get on a roller coaster. Woo! I mean, just drop down 100 feet and no gravity. and <laughs> It's just wonderful for my flesh. My flesh enjoys that. That's okay. But don't think you've arrived. Your flesh is going to come back on you again. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with righteously. I mean, maybe I'll tell you another thing I like to do. I, I like to take my boat, go out in the middle of the lake at night. I haven't been able to do that for a couple of years. Anybody want to go with me and the wife about midnight and get out on the middle of the lake and just watch the stars all, uh, for an hour or two? Oh, that's just gorgeous to get out there and look at the heavens and, and see the glory of God. That's something I like to do. That brings a lot of peace to my flesh. We were up in, uh, when we were in uh, Mauna Kea at, uh, over in uh, uh, Hawaii. Man, it is so black, the sky out there, and the, and the stars are so bright. They're just, you have, you've never seen stars till you get away from all the lights 
It's just amazing. That's just a peaceful thing for me. See, that may not be what does it for you. I mean, Ron there, Ron, he's a good, you're, you like to, I bet you get a lot of relaxation and peace from carving your decoys there. See, everybody's different, but that isn't anything spiritual, that, but that, that brings your flesh into it, doesn't it? See, we're all different. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a good thing. That's a real good thing. The only thing that Ron and I should both do, and I'm just using the two of us, uh, Ron should thank the Lord for the body he gave him, the skill he gave him, and uh, thank the Lord for the peace. And I thank the Lord that I can just stare up in the heavens and I got eyes to see his glory. God's good. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest I have not sinned. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt, as thou wast ashamed of Assyria. Yet thou shalt go forth from him, and thy hands upon thy head, for the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. Today we will start with God forgiving us, but tonight we'll deal with personal forgiveness based on God's forgiveness. One more scripture, Proverbs 30, verse 20. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. For three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with meat. You say, why is that? Well, because a servant doesn't know how to reign. Your kids don't know how to run a household. A 10-year-old kid doesn't know how to pay the mortgage and the bills and deal with FICA and um, discipline. A child, a servant, doesn't know how to be an overseer. You say, well, how do they get to... They have to be trained. They have to grow in Christ. They have to become experienced. They have to take time and patience to become mature. That's what growth's all about. For three things the earth is disquieted, for four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth. It's real easy to steer any ship in calm seas. It takes experience to steer a ship in a typhoon. And even the most experienced may still sink with the ship. Sometimes a typhoon will prevail. A fool when he's filled with meat. Do you know what's happened to your country? Same thing that God dealt with with Israel. Pride and fullness of bread and abundance of idleness has brought us to this soon extremely destructive state that our state is going to. For an odious woman, when she is married, and a handmaid that is heir to her mistress, many saints see other sins and faults without ever considering their own sins and faults through self-deceived self-love. When we get taken with ourselves, we believe we've arrived. Now, it's very easy for me to see your sins as it's very easy for you to see my sins. Look at me, I'm standing up here in front of you. Now, not a single one of you could see um, Josh picking his nose back there. I can, but you could see me picking my nose. It's so easy to see everybody else's sins because our eyes only go one direction. That's what narcissism is. It's this fella, he was a Greek, who looked at his own face in the reflection of a pond and fell in love with himself. That's what narcissism is. Self-love, self-deceived. I'm beautiful. Instead of singing, everything is beautiful, you start singing, I'm so beautiful. 
Why does this man speak blasphemies, they said? Who can forgive sins but God only? Uh, brother, tell them to come on in and sit down, okay? Never go to a human being for forgiveness of sins. Any man that wants to forgive your sins for you is a self-deluded, pompous, deceived fool. I can't forgive your sins. I can forgive you if you hurt me or sin against me. I can forgive you that action. But if you sin against me or you hurt me, you, most people fail to realize you're hurting two people when you hurt a fellow Christian. You say, how's that? You hurt God when you sin against your brother or your sister. So when you sin against your brother or sister, not only do you need to get forgiveness from them, but you need to get forgiveness for God. For David, when he harmed Uriah the Hittite, said, against the only have I sinned. So he knew he had to go to God first. Never go to a human being for forgiveness of sins when you have broken God's law because you are going to need to deal with God. Against the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Would somebody tell them to come in? They're trying to be polite and they're trying to be right. They don't want to disturb the service, but it's more disturbing for me to have them out there looking through the thing. Tell them to come on in, come on in. Tell them I want them to come in. It would be better for me. All right, see again, difference. So they've probably been trained rightfully so and good, and that's proper. But yeah, tell them to come on in. I, I'm more comfortable if they're in here. Oh, well, tell the rest of them to come in then. Who's ever, I understand. Just tell them to come in. That's less disturbing to me. Okay? Never go to a human being for forgiveness of sins. Look at Psalm 51 4. Against the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. All right? God is going to be justified when he judges us. Because God is going to show his righteousness and his sinlessness in the person in the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifests in the flesh, and he's going to say, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. And as the judge said, I find no fault in this man. So God's going to be justified when he judges us and the contrast is going to be put with us against him. And we're going to be found short. The only mediator between you and God is Jesus Christ, who was God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. If Jesus Christ was not God manifested in the flesh, he could not forgive our sins. That's very important because now we get into faith. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Through those scriptures and the witnesses of Christians, God brought me to the full belief that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ being God manifest in the flesh and sinless of himself can be my Savior and Redeemer and yours too. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Here we go. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen in the angels. See, God was manifested, Emmanuel, God with us, justified in the spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ's spirit was sinless. He walked his entire life in the spirit without sin. Seen of the angels. He had the host of heaven besides all of mankind watching him. Preached unto the Gentiles. Gave us the gospel as well as the Jews. Believed on the world. Now if you're saved, that's you. I believed on him. Received up in the glory. We are required to confess our sins to him if we desire forgiveness from him. Uh, I gave you this verse, just roughly quoting it. 1 John 1, 8. 
if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I've seen a lot of Christians that they just believe because they've been saved. Now you not to understand doctrine and spiritual truth is not always the same as reality and practical truth. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, if you got saved, and we're going to teach this, God forgave your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins, so that in your standing with him, you are sinless. It's all under the blood, and it's all been forgiven. But if you sin against me, or I sin against you, you and I can only deal with the event that took place. In other words, let's say I stole five dollars from my nephew here and he got mad and angry and said you're a thief and I said you're right I am a thief I'm sorry I was a thief here's your five dollars back would you forgive me and he said okay I forgive you well that's the limitation of the forgiveness with men he can't forgive me for next week when I steal his car because he doesn't know that's going to happen See, God can forgive me for this sin and that sin because God knows the future. God knows everything. That's why God can forgive all of our sins, past, present, and future. We cannot, and I do not forgive men for their future sins because I don't know what men's future sins are. I can forgive men for the present and past sins. And that's all we're limited to. We are required to confess our sins to him if we desire forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I'm seeing a lot of saved Christians that just don't think they have any sin. Well, you don't have any sin as far as your relationship with God goes, because it's all under the blood. But I see Christians sin in the flesh daily, sin against one another, and they, they think, well, I'm not sinning. No, you're still sinning. Just because God forgave it all, you're still doing wrong. You need, to, you, need, you need to confess it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, that's where people, and you don't have the right to do this, because again, you're not God. But this is why a lot of people start questioning other people's salvation. When you act like a heathen, live like a heathen, lie like a heathen, cheat like a heathen, act like a sinner, people look at you and say, this is, this is horrible. Well, they're making a judgment that they can't make because they say, well, they can't be saved. No, they can be saved. God forgave their past sins, their present sins, and their future sins. But in their relationship with you, they're not walking, talking, and acting like a Christian supposed to walk and talk that's walking in the Spirit. And what you can judge is this. You can't judge whether a person's saved or lost. But you can easily judge whether a person's walk in the Spirit. Don't ever tell a brother or sister that because they sin, they're lost. Just tell them they've sinned. Because they certainly have. And don't let them tell you they didn't sin. In other words, uh, here, Brother Jared's here, okay? And he's going to preach the message. But let me show you so how I've seen some pastors behave. It's like, okay, now you come over here, forget it. I'm going to preach the message. Because <laughs> I just don't think you're right with God today. And I am. That'd be really rotten to me, wouldn't it? I think so. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not saved. That just means I'm depraved. <laughs> that means I'm a rotten guy. And I need to get right, not necessarily need to get saved. I still need to confess my sin. I still need to repent. Because otherwise, we're not going to have good fellowship, are we? If we keep acting like that. It's going to like, man, this guy's too much to bear. Amen? Yeah. Now, only God can judge this. This is my personal thought. I have a problem on an individual basis, and only God knows, of Christians that keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again.
to the same person after they said they've repented. I don't know if that has anything to do with being saved or lost. But it sure is a drudgery. If you repent, God and everyone expects you to not do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Or we could say, I don't think you've really repented. I don't think that has anything to do with whether you're saved or lost. That has everything to do with whether you're right or wrong. Excuse the brother and they say, well, if they sin all the time and every time, you know, your flesh is no good. It's never going to be good. It's going to the grave. God has rejected your flesh. Your flesh has no future destiny. God saved your soul. God made your spirit right. And God's given you a new body. Your body's going to the grave. Where repentance is missing, forgiveness is not given. Him hath God exalted with his hand, right hand, to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Forgiveness then comes through repentance to God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we come up with this problem. People say, well, pastor, didn't you just see what you read? Look at that. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Well, how many of you sinned since you got saved? that you're willing to admit it, okay? How many of you sinned in the last month and willing to admit it? Okay, how many of you sinned in the last week and are willing to admit it? Well, if you listen to the brethren, you're all lost and on your way to hell. I <laughs> can't do a thing for you. So why is that? You didn't obey him, did you? God's grace and God's forgiveness is not the same as our grace and forgiveness with each other. Ours is based on a daily relationship. His is based on an eternal relationship. Can you understand that? God forgave past sins, previous sins, and future sins. Once you've truly repented and you've trusted Christ your Lord and Savior, and you're in his hand, no man, no matter how much he dislikes you, no matter how dissatisfied he is with your personal conduct, can take away your soul's salvation. On the other hand, every time you sin as a saved individual, you're still wrong. And in your relationship with men and with God, it needs to be confessed and repented of. It's called fellowship. Because I use Jared again. Jared came over here, planned to preach. I'm not going to do it to you, but i got to use it for the illustration. He thought I was a good guy until he got here. I never sinned against him. Now, if I did that and I sinned against him, he may not think I'm such a good guy. That's our personal relationships, one with another. It has nothing to do with God's grace and character and his forgiveness. You say, what's that? Well, here's the thing that you want to learn, and I'm going to close with this. You want to learn to have God's character and grace and forgiveness each time it's necessary to forgive. When I forgive somebody, it's forever forgiven as though it never happened. Because when God forgave us, he forgave our past and our present and our future sins and put it under the blood as though it never happened in his substitution of himself for us in his shedding his blood to put on the mercy seat for our redemption. What Christians need to learn to do you may have to forgive your brother daily. Because it was asked, if my brother sinned against me, how often should I forgive him? Seventy times seven, if he repent. You should hold your brother, though, to repentance. Are you truly sorry for what you did? And do you know exactly what you did? And then give him the opportunity to apologize and repent, and you should forgive it 
unconditionally forevermore as though it did not occur. That's what forgiveness is. Now, forgiveness, and I got just a minute, is not trust. And we'll be getting to that. Forgiveness is, if I gave my son the keys to the car and he goes out and has an accident and uh, incurs a debt, and let's make it real today. Let's say there is um, a loss and my insurance pays uh, half of the cost and then I have to pay the other half. half. So let's say it costs me $3,000. Well, my son has a debt to me of $3,000. If I forgive him, that debt is gone, right? I am under no obligation to let him take my new car when I get it. I am, my obligation of forgiveness is to let the debt go forever. Does that make sense? In fact, if your son was predisposed to be a poor driver, wouldn't you be quite foolish to give him another car to drive until he proved himself and learned to drive correctly? Now that's where we're at today as Christians. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to take the keys away, but you're obligated to forgive the debt anyway. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, brother, come on up.